Yes, hello everyone. So I am a pediatric sleep medicine doctor, which is sort of an unusual thing to be, but um, I started my life as a pediatric hospitalist and then moved into the world of sleep medicine from there. So I think that training kind of helped me get ready for this sort of role. I do really like taking care of chronically ill kids who have sleep problems. I like it because it's partially needing to understand the pediatric part of things, the pediatric medicine part of things, but then also understanding that they're still kids and, and a lot of what we'll talk about today are sort of healthy, regular pediatric problems as well. So in my life, let's see here, sort of a regular clinical day in the life of a pediatric sleep physician would be seeing these kinds of problems. So breathing disorders are probably the most common reason to come see a sleep doctor. A common thing would be snoring. A regular healthy kid who snores is probably my bread and butter patient. But I also see lots of kids who have excessive movements during sleep, particularly their legs. I see lots of kids who are too sleepy in the daytime, so a hypersomnia group of patients. I see lots of kids who have insomnia, difficulty achieving sleep. I see lots of kids who sleep at the wrong times of the day, circadian rhythm disorders. And of course, in pediatrics, we see tons of sleepwalking, sleep terrors, confusional arousals, things that sort of can happen that are partial sleep partial arousal disorders. So what is it about Dravet syndrome and sleeping? And this is sort of an interesting thing because certainly part of it relates to regular, healthy, normal sleep disturbances of childhood, which are so common. 25 to 30% of children will have something wrong with their sleep at some point in their lives. And I actually think that's probably a low number. But in Dravet syndrome, it actually thought is thought that the actual genetic mutation creating Dravet syndrome with all the other symptoms that go along with that are the central problem to creating sleep. One of the most important brain chemicals in achieving sleep are all of the GABAergic neurons, GABAergic meaning needing GABA as the primary neurotransmitter to turn them on or turn them off. This is something that's affected in Dravet syndrome. So the idea that you can't quiet your brain or you can't settle your brain or inhibit your brain's processes is part of what the problem is in achieving sleep in Dravet syndrome. So although we certainly don't understand all the ins and outs of what makes a person sleep, and there are so many facets that can influence that, this does seem to be one of the primary reasons that kids with Dravet syndrome can't sleep. So it's more than we know about some other syndromes, that's for sure. Kids with Dravet seem to have the same risk of having sleep apnea, so if they snore, if they have funny sounding breaths at night, that is still something that would not be considered part of Dravet syndrome necessarily. Although people with general epilepsy do have a higher rate of abnormal movements during sleep, so that might be something that people think about and talk about as well. So, there have been a number of studies done in patients with Dravet syndrome, children with Dravet syndrome. This, is, this was actually interesting, not that the colors are all super important, but you can see along the bottom here, these are the age groups. So these are children that are less than five years, kids that are five to 10, so sort of split up according to adults, teenagers, then your elementary schools here. Percentage along this line. The colors have to do with the specific sleep problems. So this first orange one are disorders of initiating and maintaining sleep. So anybody with insomnia. And you can see this is much higher. For most people, this would be maybe an average of 10 to 15%. So kids with Dravet syndrome have much higher reported problems of sleep. And even when it gets into the adult range, you see how high that is. Yeah, these are all just split up sleep disorder sorts of things. This is disorders of arousal, so this sort of third blue line here. So you're much more likely to have wakings than people without Dravet syndrome. These are sleep-wake transition disorders, and certainly, so these are problems like parasomnias, sleepwalking, sleep terrors, which we commonly see in this age range of kids, but the commonality that I would see would be 25 to 30 percent. So you see in kids with Dravet syndrome much higher, and even persisting into higher ages. So people are very good at doing studies that classify what the problems are in Dravet syndrome. I notice we're not very good about talking about what to do about them necessarily. So. 
how to help if these are things that you're seeing in your kid. Well, your friendly neighborhood sleep doctor can be of help for you. So the way you go about finding your neighborhood sleep physician, you can see online sleep labs and sleep medicine centers are not required, but encouraged to be accredited. So one way to look is just by the accrediting bodies that are on the internet, certainly. And you can always ask your primary care doctor or your, the neurologist that takes care of you because, as Dr. Perry pointed out, I'm sure most neurologists have their favorite sleep doctor that they know to send their patients to for all the other reasons as well. So then that would look like an appointment in clinic with somebody who is working there at the sleep center. You discuss your symptoms, a physical exam is done, you talk about the history of all of those sleep problems, and then you decide whether there are any diagnostic tests that can be helpful or could offer more information. And I think this is sort of important because there's so much confusion surrounding sleep studies and whether they're really helpful for kids that have Dravet syndrome, followed by a treatment that you might decide upon. So here's a cute little five or six year old girl that's getting ready for her sleep study, which is really the common name, of course, that we call polysomnograms, the official medical term for a sleep study. And you can recognize maybe some of these leads just from other uh, neurologic procedures a person may have had done, but we do six EEG leads, so not as many as a full EEG for sure. We also do two leads that are by the eyes, the ocular leads. We have two on the chin. We have EKG patches that you can't quite see under there and two patches that go on the legs. We have this stretchy belt around her tummy, stretchy belt around her chest. We have the pulse oximeter on her finger. And then you see two tubes. I mean, they're sort of fixed together here, but a tube that goes under her nose, sitting in between your nose and mouth. All of this has to stay on while you sleep for ideal testing purposes. And of course, everybody here who's ever been a part of a pediatric sleep study knows that not all of this stays on. We really make it our goal, but I think everybody in my position would say that's sort of the, the ultimate goal, and maybe you don't reach that every time. So this is what you try for. And so certainly, there are some patients that would never be able to tolerate this sort of test. All of these monitors on and then say, oh yeah, now lay back in a strange hospital and go to sleep. So I think it's hard for a neurotypical kid to get through a sleep study. And I think one of the things I really try to evaluate is, am I going to cause more trouble than I'm going to gain information? And certainly, since the risk of sleep apnea is the same in Dravet syndrome as in everybody else, it's not everybody who needs a sleep study. So, with that kind of knowledge, <laughs> there's our darling picture. And what can a sleep study really tell us? So it can certainly tell me if your breathing is abnormal, if you have obstructive sleep apnea and you don't have air entry in an easy fashion. It can tell me if you have central sleep apnea, your brain isn't telling you to take breaths as regularly as it should. It can show me if your legs are moving too much at night, if you're twitching in ways. It can show me if you're having seizures in the night, that sort of thing. But it cannot really tell us anything about insomnia, maybe other than the pattern of when a person is sleeping. So it can't tell me why a person can't fall asleep. And it doesn't really always tell me why a person wakes up. It might just be that night that you woke up at 1.30 in the morning. And it might be that you wake up at 3 a.m. every night at your house, but because the hookup was so traumatic and you fell asleep crying, you may sleep right through the 3 a.m. wake up that's been frustrating your mom for years anyway. So some of this, you have to know what you're gonna get out of your sleep study before you even order it, I think. So then, of course, if you get a result from your sleep study that needs fixing, in pediatrics, we can simply remove your tonsils and adenoids if you have obstructive sleep apnea. We sometimes use oxygen, or here's a, a delightful picture of a girl with her CPAP machine in place. In children, we're lucky, we can sometimes just initiate orthodontics a little bit earlier. So this is a palatal expander. As you see, this kid has a real narrow oropharynx and a very highly arched palate, so we can help with some craniofacial growth and help sleep apnea get better. And for older teenagers there and adults, there are sort of fancy new machines. This is a a surgically implanted neurostimulator that when you have sleep apnea will stimulate this hyoid muscle right under here so that you don't have your obstructive events. You turn it on at night and then you turn it off in the morning. So there are some fancy things that can be fixed. 
With movement disorders, which are actually a common problem in children, really the most common treatment that we use are iron supplements. So we've found that supplementing a person's iron stores helps you move your legs less. And so this is true for restless leg syndrome, which is actually a problem when you're awake. It's helpful for periodic limb movement disorder, which is leg kicks when you're asleep. Um, and can has actually been shown to help in children with autism and frequent movements at night that aren't even really one of those movement disorders. So it, it does seem that boosting your iron stores maybe helps with sleep quality across the board. I think there will probably be studies in the future showing that even adults should supplement their iron to make their sleep a little bit better. There are also prescription medicines that can help your body and legs calm down in the night if they're moving too much. Most typically, I see the kids that have periodic limb movement disorder that move too much, so there are medicines that can help with that too that are, are of the prescription type. So insomnia. Of course, this is the biggest problem in people with Dravet syndrome, so this is, this is sort of the meat of the topic here. So when, when you see a child with insomnia, most of the time, when I talk to parents, they will mention that really the problem's been there their whole life. So even if the child is only three years old, it's been three years of up, down, and all around. And so the issue becomes, a child figures out what to do overnight. They either figure out how to help themselves, and so they can develop some interesting things that parents will then see in the night that help them get to sleep, or they sometimes figure out things that they do instead, because if it's really too hard to get to sleep, and we've put a three-year-old in a room for 12 hours by themselves in the dark, they will find something else to do if sleep isn't coming. And it doesn't always mean that they're being a bad child. It means that they're sort of making do with what their situation is. So they can develop these behavioral things that then aren't helping them get to sleep, or in some cases are. But as I mentioned, iron supplementation has also been shown to help with even um, improving the quality of sleep overnight, so that's something that we sometimes use. Certainly everybody's heard of melatonin, and you can buy that just at a grocery store, and we talk about which brands to get or which better brands to get to try to minimize the fillers or the combination products and how to use it and when to use it, and these are all sort of questions that are generally being worked out. Some of those questions are answered, some of them still aren't. And then there are prescription medications that some of us use. So I love this picture. This is one of the behavioral disorders. There are sort of a few common behavioral disorders for kids. So she's in here. You can see her. This is a, a great picture for a sleep onset association disorder. This is a behavioral problem. If your child needs everybody to be in their place, needs this bottle, this yellow one, with specifically four ounces in it, you don't see the parents sitting over here reading the same book that they've been reading for 12 months. You have to do the same voice. You can't read it too fast. All of these things have to be in place for this kid to fall asleep. So if that is the case, if it takes all of these steps in order to have sleep be achieved, then that is a sleep onset association disorder. And it may not be a problem if it's 7 p.m. and you're able to do all this and do the voice and sit there and read the book. But it's a problem at 2 a.m. when a child has a, what would be a normal awakening. It is normal to wake up overnight. The abnormality comes in how the child responds. So what a child should do when they wake at 2 in the morning is roll over and go back to sleep. And what they're doing instead is coming to find you so that you can recreate all of these things so that it can happen again. So that's where the problem really comes, obviously. The other common behavioral problem is limit setting disorder. So these are, I, I don't love the term limit setting because I feel like it's very accusatory to parents. So like, I didn't set the right limits. I didn't make sure that the kid went to bed. I don't love that, but that's what it's called. And so it's the kids that you put to bed and they come out. Oh, I forgot to have a drink of water. Okay. Oh, I got a, I, mom, I think I heard something in the side yard. Okay, well, and then you come back. Well, mom, I just thought about tomorrow. I was thinking maybe I'd wear the red shorts. Can you get those for me? And so it's all those things that they think of, and it really is just stalling. So these are two of the most common things that kids will create or, or bring up that really don't have to do specifically just with Dravet syndrome. This would be a problem for anybody who has difficulty falling asleep. How do I delay any of this? Well, 
I have to set up all my babies in the right way. Well, I can come out and remind you about the red shorts for tomorrow and all that sort of thing. So that is the most common type of insomnia in children, but also develops as a secondary problem when you have trouble sleeping uh, neurochemically. So those are treated with behavioral techniques. So when your friendly pediatric sleep medicine doctor is telling you some of this will have to be fixed with things that you do or things the way that the child is put to bed, it's probably true because I think most often it's a combination of how the parents are reacting, how the kid is reacting to having trouble, as well as the problem that their brains don't do such a great job of sleeping to start with. And as kids get older, they can have these problems too. They're certainly more common in the toddler age range, but even teenagers can do some of this. And so there are workbooks, there are books to read, there are lots of things that are available for helping with this. Iron supplements, since this has become such a hot topic for sleep medicine doctors over the last couple years, um, it's dosed in terms of elemental iron, and it's a milligrams per kilogram sort of thing, so there are specific uh, ways that we prescribe iron supplements to be used. But I'm thrilled to say that there is a new formulation of iron, iron carbonyl, that everybody is sort of turning to. These are two of the most common brands that I've seen that is a chewable form of iron, so it tastes good. It's easy on your intestines, doesn't seem to cause the constipation that the previous liquids have always caused in people. And they, they do make your iron stores rise a little bit more slowly than the traditional liquids, but you know, who cares if they'll actually take it? I think it's probably a better thing for everybody. They also have vitamin C in them, which helps your body absorb iron. So it's helpful there. Melatonin, there, there were actually some specific studies done in Dravet syndrome with melatonin, the DREAMS study. And they used one to three milligrams, which is certainly what I recommend in terms of where to start for melatonin dosage. I do think it's okay to use some of those combination products that are made. I think I've seen Calm Forte is a famous one, and I'm sure there are others. I think you'll want to know what's in those products. So if you read the slide, I would just make sure that you recognize some of the words, or at least don't feel like there are a lot of additives that would make you nervous. Um, but I don't think the combination products are necessarily bad for melatonin. Melatonin is something that your brain makes. It is part of the internal clock of your brain. So taking melatonin has always been shown to be helpful for jet lag, which is a problem of changing time zones. If you get to be on a real late bedtime, late to get up um, sleep schedule like we all did during pandemic, melatonin can be helpful to bring you back to a regular time. So it it's good for sleep onset insomnia. It doesn't always change later in the night awakenings, which I think is key because if your child doesn't have trouble falling asleep, melatonin may not make any sorts of changes in the sleep pattern at all. They do make extended release formations. They generally have to be swallowed as their whole pill. So it's mostly for older children, I would think. I can't decide if they're really helpful or not. I have some patients who love the extended release and swear by it and say that it does help them with their later in the night awakenings. And some people really say they didn't notice any difference with use of that. So specifically, this DREAM study was interesting because it was, it was a questionnaire-based study. So parents answered for their children. And really, the people that were on melatonin reported a great improvement in the kids' ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. But they did some testing that I'll show you on the next slide, and I'm not sure. They reported that there was really no difference in the sleep. So I almost wonder if it's like a placebo for parents, which is kind of interesting and sort of a bummer. But one of the other tests or one of the other diagnostic uh, tools that a sleep doctor has is called an actigraph. And so it is this watch that a person wears, and actually they make even a smaller one now that looks sort of like a Fitbit. It's just as wide as the band, but it's a waterproof watch that you wear for two weeks at a time, and it measures light and movement. And so then this is the sort of printout that you get from an actigraph over here. So two weeks of time, here's Tuesday, here's week one, then here's week two. This is starting at noon, and then midnight is here, and then so you're going into the next day. So your sleep period is this blue. 
The black line at the bottom is movement. So when you're active and moving around and playing, then this line is sort of thick, and you see here is sleep with a little bit of movement here, you can tell, in the middle of the night. And then the yellow is when you're exposed to light. So then the yellow goes away, and they chose blue as their nighttime color, so that's when the light goes away. So if you look at this, I mean, this kid had sort of a late bedtime on Friday, sort of late bedtime on Saturday. This is a five-year-old, by the way. So you wonder if they're during the week, maybe they had a school program that they were attending that sort of helped to keep them regulated. Their wake-up time varied a little bit. I mean, it's right around 6, but here's maybe 7, and here's maybe 5.30. And then with melatonin, I mean, you do get the sense that this is a little bit more regulated, a little bit more regulated in when they woke up. And I even think you see a little bit less movement in their sleep period. So like you look at this night and there's a bunch of movement and they're moving all around here. Uh, you do get a little bit of a sense that maybe the sleep quality was better, maybe. And I definitely think it looks like the sleep onset and even waking in the morning looks a little better on melatonin. So I don't know. Okay. So prescription medications. Dun, dun, dun. There are, sadly, no FDA-approved medicines for use in pediatrics in anybody. For, under the age of 18, there are no medicines approved strictly for insomnia. There are some medicines that are FDA approved in certain syndromes or for certain things, none in Dravé actually. Most of the sleep disorders that have specific FDA approval are um, more chronic in nature, so they started by getting FDA approval for adults and then sort of dragged it into the kid range. So all the medicines that pediatric sleep doctors are using are just trial and error. We try this. And so the method that I've sort of used is I try to get to what's behind the insomnia. And certainly it makes sense in a broader group of children. If you're a kid with anxiety, then I know that's kind of where I'm going to try to attack. What can I help with in the day to make your anxiety better? And then is there a medicine that would make you feel less nervous or have less fears right at the time of bedtime? Certainly in ADHD, this is something, if I hear that you have ADHD, I already sort of have my list of medicines in my brain that we might use. So with Dravet, it could be a couple of things. And honestly, a lot of times it's been kind of a combination. I certainly know that just having Dravet syndrome means that your brain doesn't slow down or shut down as easily. And we know that from what I mentioned earlier, that the GABAergic neurons don't seem to do the right action. So... The groups of medicines that I tend to use are in the antihistamine group, the sedating antipressants group, and sometimes alpha-2 agonists, which also are used sometimes with uh, patients with ADHD. You, the one thing that I try to be careful of are interactions with other medicines, of course, and that can be tough now because we're understanding more and more about which enzymatic pathways drugs are metabolized by. So, I've had to write them down. I'm really not embarrassed about it because I feel like it's a new thing that we're learning more about every day. The other thing we're learning more about are the pharmacokinetics for each individual person. So some people don't metabolize drugs as well as others. So there's not enough available drug in their body for utilization by their brain to get to sleep. So there are always things that a person can learn and try. I don't feel like I'm any braver than any other sleep medicine doctor in trying medicine, but we certainly give it a go. So I thought I'd close out with my sleep needs graph because I still run into people just about every day that think that a four-year-old should get eight hours of sleep. And I still run into people that believed that terrible mattress commercial from years ago that said you should get a better six. I about fell out for that one. So can I answer questions now? Okay. Um, if, if iron helps with sleep, do you suggest giving it at nighttime, at bedtime? You know, it doesn't have to do so much with when you give it. It's more that if you have high normal iron stores in your body, it seems to improve sleep quality. And 
not that we really know what that comes from, but there are people that are assuming or looking into whether iron can calm irritated nerves. So it has something to do with calming the nervous system, um, regulating some of those activating chemicals. So if you have low iron stores, which it's very difficult because it may, it may not mean you're anemic, it may mean that your body is using all of its iron to produce red blood cells and not leaving any more for the rest of its um, metabolic functions. So sleep doctors actually check a ferritin number, which is one of the proteins that carries iron, and that's how we gauge if, if you have enough ferritin in your body, we know it's because your body is carrying this iron around appropriately. So we like to get it real high. And then... <laughs> Do you suggest giving the vitamin C if, okay, I give them iron at night. Mm -hmm. Do you suggest giving the vitamin C at night with the iron or does yes. it Yes, you want to give those together. Together, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, going back to the beginning of your presentation when you were talking about GABA, Yes. Could you touch more upon that? So with Dravé, is it that the, the GABA uptake, it, there's a dysregulation in GABA and serotonin? And two, would you supplement those exog exogenously? So that's an interesting thought. And I, in, in learning that it's more the GABAergic pathways that are affected in Dravé, it did make me wonder if I should use more gabapentin. And I have to say that I've used gabapentin much as I've done in all the other patients I take care of. I use it as more of a secondary medicine. I have to say I don't use it as one of my first tries. Um, but I think that I might be changing my ways after learning that. It does seem that the GABAergic neurons and GABAergic pathways are diminished. So whether they don't work as well or whether they are um, negatively affected in another way, I don't think is understood yet. And nobody said anything about serotonin pathways. So this is pretty strictly GABAergic pathways they talked about. I know. I mean, I'm glad they're learning something. It helps. But, yeah. You've used a lot of gabapentin, right, Dr. Perry? Yeah. I might. I'm, I just want to make sure I heard you right. Did you say earlier that the, uh, sleep disturbances or things that you're dealing with with your Dravet child... It, it typically happens early, and then you usually experience that throughout, or did you say something different? So yeah. as of what age are you usually seeing these children come in? So that's a good question. I feel like I see most children after the age of one before the age of three. And that's why I feel like what's happened is that sleep is never, well, in the baby timeline, I think they all do a pretty good job of you know, cat naps during the day. That seems to go well. And then it's when they're starting to spread out to longer sleep overnight and shorter naps in the day. That's where I feel like I start to hear about differences and problems and difficulty with it. And that's where I think then it becomes the challenge of the child developing negative habits but still having this underlying neurochemical problem of difficulty with sleep. And that's where I, I think you can develop some of the more difficult behavioral problems on top of that trouble. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So to me, I don't think the length of the nap is, is bad or good. I think it's when does it end? What time does it end? So if it's 5 o'clock, I would say, well, can we move that up? That, I think, would be the important part. And then how much overnight sleep is he getting? So I think between those two, you know, a two-hour nap would be fine if he's only getting eight hours overnight or even less than that. So, yeah, then I think it would be great. And you just don't want it to be too close to your bedtime because, you know, the idea of sleep pressure or sleep debt is that you have to develop, you have to build up your sleep pressure so that you feel sleepy enough to go to sleep. So all those kids that take those 5.30 p.m. 20-minute cat naps in the car are not tired at 7 or 7.30, those toddlers, when they need to go to bed because they just decreased their sleep debt a little bit, and so now they're going to push it off and fight it. So, tricky. <laughs> yes. 
Wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I once had a sleep doctor tell me that if a child needs a nightlight, it's best to be in a red, orange, or amber color because the longer wavelength is less likely to interact with your or disrupt your circadian rhythm. Is that true? It is true. You know, I think we're lucky anymore that when I've gone to look for a nightlight at the store anymore, it's not even the um, original nightlights like I'm used to. It's more the, the glow. I think it's an LED glowing light with some kind of filter over it. So I'm not sure. And I think the glow in and of itself is not in a bad wavelength so as to to really disrupt your sleep. I think it, for it to be a problem, it really has to be close to your face and, and going through your eyeballs to communicate with upper parts of your brain. So I, I think you're okay with some of the newer nightlights that are available now. But it, it's a good question and something that we try to think about. We think about it more, I think, with the Kindles and with telephones because you hold them so close to your face that that really does get into your eye light, eyesight. Yeah. So this question is back to, you had mentioned gabapentin. Mm -hmm. That is relatively contraindicated in patients with Dravet syndrome. I think it's because of an old study from epileptic encephalopathies from the 90s yeah. in which when given gabapentin, myoclonic seizures were exacerbated. So with that, um, I'm wondering about like true experience with gabapentin for sleep disorders in Dravet patients and if yeah the myoclonics were exacerbated. So I only have one patient that I can think of with Drave that I have on gabapentin. And really it was more, I like gabapentin because of how long it lasts. So I think we were trying to extend the sleep duration overnight. And we didn't notice any change in seizures, but it's interesting that you bring that up. It's something I didn't know. Yeah, and I, w I would say that's a, I don't know, Linda, you can say too. I, that's a a general concern in generalized epilepsies in particular about gabapentin, but I can't necessarily say that I've necessarily seen it to be true either. Yeah. Especially when used for sleep, you know. If I'm using it all day, a big dose is maybe, but if I'm just using it for onset of sleep, I haven't really seen yeah. it's been that big of a problem. I have to say I'm lucky with gabapentin. I mean, I'm lucky with most medicines. I don't tend to see a lot of the side effects because I am only doing one dose at night, so I, maybe that's the difference, yeah. Hi, um, my daughter has recently started waking in the middle of the night and she's having these episodes of uh, eye flutters where she's trying to go back to sleep but her when she closes her eyes it's like a seizure type and then it turns into this horrible night terror where it's oh. screaming. Yeah. Do you have any experience with that? And How old is she? She's 11. Okay. And are you guys developing, or do you know of anybody developing alternatives to all of those electrodes, EEG <laughs> wires, to help with sleep studies? Because it's impossible for my they daughter. Are, it's just too stressful. It induces seizures. Yeah. I think for your sleep study question, there are people that have developed wireless sleep studies. So you still have to put the stickers on, but you don't then have the additional wire that has to leave and plug into the head box that sits with you. So, I mean, that may be a tiny bit easier. There are home sleep studies that can be done, but they solely look at breathing problems. So it wouldn't tell you anything about the pattern of sleep overnight, wouldn't tell you about leg movements overnight, that sort of thing. So kind of yes and no, I know. I actually think the future of all of that will just be in biomarkers. So someday we'll just be able to do a blood test to look for a protein that's higher when you have sleep apnea and higher when you have periodic limb movement disorder. So hopefully they'll just go away, but not currently. And so for your child, you know, the thing about the parasomnia part, of course, you know, my first thought would be, well, get your neurologist to fix that. Isn't that always nice when I say that? Hey, hold up, hold up. <laughs> so, but for the, the parasomnia part of things, you know, you can ensure that she's getting all the sleep that you can get her, knowing that that is always a problem. But it, it, parasomnias are more likely to happen in people that are sleep deprived, just like seizures. So the more sleep overall, the better. Is she scared of this happening at night? Does she, yeah. So. If you, are, if you go to sleep in sort of a fearful state, you're more likely to have a sleepwalk or a sleep terror or something like that. So I almost wonder if one thing you can do is to talk about that. I'll be right here. These will get better. 
you don't have to be scared, you're always with me, or I'm always right in the next room from you. I wonder if that would be a way to do it, to help with it. That's a tough one. Yikes. Great. Uh, <laughs> Hillary, thank you so much.